Good afternoon and welcome to this Uni Taste Tuesday. My name is John. I'm here from Uni Taste Days and I'm going to be hosting this event today where we're going to be exploring university courses in chemical engineering. Now, I'm absolutely delighted to have two exceptional speakers for this event. I'm joined by Dr. Smart Vagunaratna, joining us from Teesside University, and also Adam Jones, joining us from Swansea University. Smart, for in a second, is going to open, open things up, providing an introduction, introduction to chemical engineering. So, perhaps reasons to consider chemical engineering, you know, quite broadly, what chemical engineering actually is. And then we're going to pass to Adam Jones from Swansea University, who's going to look at application tips for chemical engineering courses, and as well as that, an overview of careers in chemical engineering as well. Always conscious with these events, you're here to hear from our excellent speakers, not from myself. So I'll now pass things over to Dr. Smart Vergunaratna, join us from Teesside University, Principal Lecturer in Chemical Engineering, for an introduction to chemical engineering. Over to you, Smart. Right. So you probably have heard of chemical engineering and you think, yep, it's probably well paid, um, it's interesting, it has societal impact, but you're not quite sure what it is other than that. Okay, and that's one of the things about chemical engineering, there are a lot of misconceptions about what the field is and what it's about. So the thing about chemical engineering is if you talk to 100 people, you're probably gonna get 100 different definitions of um, the industry or the subject area, depending on what that individual's connection with it is. So I'll show you a few of the common ones. So a lot of people say, well, if you like maths, if you like chemistry and maybe a little, little bit of physics, then yeah, that's chemical engineering. Then some people will say, well, it's like mechanical engineering, but with some chemistry thrown in. You'll get certain industries, certain countries where they actually call it industrial chemistry and then others where they call it process engineering. Now, the thing is, it is all of these plus a few others, okay? And that is the beauty of chemical engineering in that you kind of, you can make it what you want it to be, okay? Which is great for you as a prospective chemical engineer, quite tricky for us as universities to define what a chemical engineer is and how we get you to be one, okay? So what we've done um, at my institution is we've come up with a bit of a definition that we think is quite a broad definition, but something that still explains what a chemical engineer is. So the main thing is a chemical engineer is a professional, right? Who exploits physical and chemical properties to design modify and operate reactive and non-reactive processes. And these processes are safe, reliable, economical, and sustainable. And they apply to a variety of industries. Okay, so that's quite, it's still quite a broad definition, but it captures pretty much what most chemical engineers do in some way or another, okay? So then the next thing is, right, we've got this fantastic definition, if I do say so myself, how do we get you to be one, right? How do we get you from where you are now, whether you're in school or college, doing A-levels or B-tech or whatever qualification that you're doing, how do we actually get you to this kind of chemical engineer, right? So let's look at each one in turn. Right, so the professional bit, we teach you what most universities will call employability skills, okay? So there are a few things that kind of come under that umbrella and whichever university you go to, whatever type of chemical engineering course you do, you're going to get some exposure to those things. So communication skills, organization skills, team working skills. There's a lot of group work. There's a lot of project work because that's the nature of the, the discipline. So you'll get a lot of experience about that. It is a hands-on discipline. So there'll be a fair bit of lab work, um, especially in kind of the first few years. And then again, when you're doing your more detailed projects at the end. And increasingly universities are conscious of the fact that you have the internet at your disposal and how do you trust the information that you can find there? How do you use that in the correct way to impact on what chemical engineering you're doing. So information literacy is a really important thing, okay? So 
those are the type of skills, what some people might call transferable skills that you need to be a professional engineer. Now, the next part is about exploiting physical and chemical properties. And that's where your science comes in, okay? So when you say, oh yeah, you need chemistry to be a chemical engineer. Well, you don't need all of chemistry and you don't need it all the time, but you do need a fair bit of it some of the time, okay? And it's not so much you learning new chemistry at university, it's you learning how to use the chemistry that you've already learned or you're learning um, at school or college, okay? So there are plenty of chemical engineers who haven't got much to do with chemistry in their day-to-day -day work, but they needed to be able to understand the concepts at some point, okay? Another thing is thermodynamics, which um, you may have come across in physical chemistry if you're doing uh, that subject uh, at school as part of your chemistry syllabus. There's also a bit of um, engineering thermodynamics, so how gases and liquids behave under certain conditions. Okay, and that's really important because obviously whatever we are working with is either a liquid or a gas or a solid, it's going to do stuff under different uh, conditions. Then your fluid mechanics. So this is where your physics comes in. Okay, because again, you're dealing with fluids flowing through pipes and vessels, right? And I've added biology there. It's a lesser known kind of um, component of chemical engineering. But if you think about what's in the news at the moment with the vaccines and um, pharmaceuticals, there's a lot of chemical engineering involved in getting those medicines out to a large population. Okay, so whilst it's not essential, it can be useful, right? Even with the chemistry, if you're not studying chemistry um, currently, that's not necessarily a problem. Most universities will have some kind of mechanism to help you uh, kind of build up your chemistry knowledge, okay? The main thing is the awareness and the understanding of it, and then how you actually use it is what we cover in the chemical engineering courses, okay? So, right, you've understood these physical and chemical properties. Now, what, what are we gonna, how are we gonna exploit them? Well, we're going to design, modify, and operate these processes, okay? Now I've listed reactive and non-reactive processes separately here, because when the, if you think back on the previous slide, when I said people think, oh yeah, maths and chemistry and physics, that's your chemical engineering, or even maths and chemistry, some people would leave out the physics completely. Well, that's only the reactive processes. Okay, what about the non-reactive processes? What about filtration, centrifugation, right? What about um, evaporation? All of those things are chemical engineering processes. Okay, so, and the massive parts of the chemical plants that you see around. So they're really important, but there's no reaction taking place. Okay, so chemistry only forms part of it. It's the more kind of bringing together all the sciences. That's where chemical engineering is, is really key. So how do we do this? Well, that's where your maths comes in, okay? And again, similar to what I said earlier about the sciences, you're not using all of your maths all the time. You're using some of your maths a lot of the time. So a lot of chemical engineering is related to the rate at which things happen. So a rate of a chemical reaction, a rate of a flow of some material. So therefore, calculus is really key, okay? Your differentiation integration, you're gonna be using those a lot. Algebra, because we have so many different processes going on with so many different parameters, X and Y is not enough to define all of them. So you need to be able to work with algebra to understand what's going on, okay? Now, the last bit is something that you may not have come across yet, and that's mathematical modeling. Okay, because what we are doing on chemical engineering courses is we are taking these uh, processes that we can see in industry and in order to understand them, in order to control them, in order to predict them, we are using mathematical equations to describe what's going on. And that is what mathematical modeling entails. Okay, so you're going to be using your algebra and your calculus to develop these models so that you can test out your processes. Now, the thing with these processes, it's great. You've designed it, it works perfectly great, but then something blows up and lots of people get hurt. Well, that's not ideal. Or 
you get the product that you want today and tomorrow you're not getting anything for some reason, also not okay. Or you've made your product today and you've run out of money so you can't make it tomorrow. Or you made your product today, but then you've run out of your raw material and you can't make it anymore. Right, so hopefully you've seen I've addressed each of those four um, kind of bubbles that are on the screen. So it's really important that a chemical engineer is able to consider how to make processes safe, reliable, economical, and sustainable. And the way we do that is by teaching you about it. Okay, so we've got process safety, process control, then process economics, and obviously sustainability from a chemical engineering perspective. Okay, sustainability is a huge area and most universities will approach it from a chemical engineering perspective for your ChemEng courses. And then finally, something that I think Adam is going to touch on in his uh, section of the talk is that chemical engineering is such a vast subject area that I mentioned pharmaceuticals earlier, you might be working in pharmaceuticals, you might be working in oil and gas, you might be working in consumables, you might be working in water purification. There's so many. How as a university can we teach you all of it? Well, we can't, okay? So what we do is we teach you enough of the fundamentals and then by involving industrial partners, by involving cutting edge research, by giving you some optionality, especially in your kind of your more senior years, and by encouraging you to go on industrial placement, we give you the flavor of the different industries. So you can see how what you learn, the fundamentals that you learn can be applied in different areas. Okay, so hopefully that shows you how a university course would help you become a chemical engineer. Okay, now the other aspect of university courses, okay, well, how long does it take? How does it all work? When do you learn all of this stuff? Okay, so that's another thing that I just want to go through. Now, each university will have a slightly different structure. Okay, but what I've presented on the screen here is pretty generic, I'd like to think. Okay, so more students will enter in year one. And I think Adam's going to talk a little about application tips and things. So sometimes the foundation year might be appropriate for you. If you end up doing um, an apprenticeship or a higher national certificate, you might come into year two, right? All universities will encourage you to get some kind of industrial experience and different universities might encourage you to do that between year two and year three, or if you're on the MNG between year three and year four. Okay, so you've got that kind of general map of how you would move through the, the course. And like I said, this is the, I mean, this is the structure we have, but it's generally uh, applicable to a lot of universities. There may be slight differences, but this is the general theme. Okay, and there may be some uh, flexibility of moving between the BNG and the MNG, depending on how you're doing in your studies at the time. But each university will be able to tell you about that. Right. So the, the last thing that I want to show you is, okay, fine, you know what you need to learn. I've shown you that. You know how you move through the course. We've got that on this screen. How do, you, how do we actually map those across? Okay, so what happens is, if we look at year zero and year one, so your foundation year and year one, we're usually covering the fundamentals. Okay, then, kind of a little bit in year one and a lot in year two, we're looking at core chemical engineering concepts and their applications, okay? And then when you move into your kind of final years, your senior years, you're looking at advanced concepts, right? What the, the professional body, what the institution chemical engineering would call advanced depth and breadth, right? And you're looking at those applications or the, or the applications of those concepts as well. So that's how you kind of move through the course. And at each point, a university will kind of aim to teach you those skills or kind of aim to impart those skills that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so that is my whistle stop 
kind of tour of what chemical engineering is as a general idea and how a university would help you get from um, school or college level to that graduate level and how you would work through um, the years. Okay, I'm going to hand back to, to John now. Thank you, Samantha. Really, really appreciate that. What a brilliant introduction to chemical engineering courses. Um, absolutely fantastic. Really appreciate that. So that's Dr. Samantha Gunaratna, Principal Lecturer with Teesside University, delivering a wonderful introduction to chemical engineering courses. Our next speaker is Adam Jones. Adam is a Student Recruitment Manager with the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Swansea University. And Adam's going to as far as Samantha's session, she, she looked at, at the introductory subjects, so why to consider chemical engineering, what it involves, idea of course structures, etc. Adam's now going to kind of take things to the, the next perspective on it, and that's two things. A, application tips, and, and Adam is, is very involved in applications, and, and we are able to give you some great tips on, on making sure your application stands out. And then linked to that, an idea of careers relate after, after a chemical engineering course as well. So Adam, I'll pass the floor to you, please. Great, thank you, uh, John, and uh, thank you to Dr. Gunaratna there. And as mentioned, I'm gonna, uh, now that you know a lot more about what chemical engineering is as a subject area, um, what it involves, how you're taught and how you'd move through your degree. Uh, I wanna begin, first of all, by talking about um, what you go um, and what you could potentially do beyond your degree. Now, an important thing to consider when looking at um, any subject uh, at any university is for its accreditation, okay? So in chemical engineering, um, the main body um, responsible for accreditation, uh, certainly here in the UK, is the Institute of Chemical Engineers, uh, commonly known as the ICHEM-E. Um, so everything that's, uh, that Dr. Gunaratna has just spoken about um, would, for accreditation purposes, be assessed uh, by this external body responsible for chemical engineering in the UK. Um, it would look at what you're taught, um, how you are taught, um, how you are assessed, um, and ultimately how relevant that is to applied industry. OK, so if an organisation, if a, a programme is accredited by the ICHEM, you know, a case in chemical engineering, it means that it's met their approval to be a certain set standard based on the needs of the sector as a whole. And what that means in terms of accreditation, um, it means that a graduate from an accredited programme um, is on the way to becoming a chartered engineer. Okay, so a, a chartered engineer uh, is, um, it's done through academic and professional development. And when you become a chartered engineer um, through meet and set criteria, it opens up other potential um, position and role uh, fields uh, within certain companies, within certain sectors. Um, you can become more senior. You have certain responsibilities that non-chartered engineers um, would have. Uh, and from that, uh, it is another path to more income, basically. So if you are serious about engineering uh, as a long-term career, um, you should be aiming for chartered engineer status. The first step towards that is the accreditation. So it's really important at undergraduate level, especially, uh, and at postgraduate level, whatever program you're looking at is accredited. Uh, what you would need to do beyond your degree then uh, is to achieve a master's level at least uh, and then through certain professional evidence, so applied professional evidence, you can then work towards that status. Now in terms of the types of jobs that you can go into and the types of sectors in which you can work in, um, Dr Gunaratna has, has um, put across really well just how diverse uh, chemical engineering is. Uh, as a fundamental sciences uh, and mathematics and different applications. Uh, and that then relates and is exemplified by the types of companies and the types of sectors you can work in. So a common misconception is that um, chemically, chemical engineers can only work in the oil and gas sector or the oil and gas sector is made up of only chemical engineers. That's not the case. Ultimately, any company that's involved uh, in taking raw materials and making them useful through the processes that Dr. Gunaratna has, uh, has described, um, you know, chemical engineers are involved with that. So ga gas and oil extraction, absolutely. You've got oil refining uh, and nuclear and other power generation. 
Um, chemical engineers are an integral part of that, as well as some other types of engineers and scientists. Um, so mechanical engineers uh, are really common to find uh, in these types of sectors as well. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, another name for the subject area is process engineering. So we've got process industries as well. So pharmaceuticals uh, work with fine and heavy chemicals uh, and agrochemicals apply in it in a different way. Chemical engineers are absolutely uh, integral to that. Uh, ultimately, when it comes to process, uh, when we want to look at um, efficiency, um, then chemical engineers are critical for that. Okay, so in pharmaceuticals, um, if uh, a company wants to increase yield of production, uh, then chemical engineers are responsible for that. So again, there's lots of jobs available that are very well rewarded um, for chemical engineers. And of course, they're manufacturing. So again, if we're looking at process involved there, so whether it's work with fibers and polymers, uh, the food and drink industry, uh, the plastic industry and working with pulp and paper uh, and the manufacturing of toiletries and hygiene products. You know, we are taking raw materials and it's that step between that you end up with the finished product, chemical engineers are required. Now, aside from working in the traditional, um, you know, multinational companies that make a lot of money and you as a worker could make a lot of money as well, um, as has been alluded to already, you can make societal impact. So when we're looking at the processes involved with manufacturing uh, or power and energy uh, or processes, then um, we're looking at controlling pollution uh, and minimizing damage to the environment. Uh, we're looking at conserving energy. We're looking at um, recovering waste uh, and recycling. We're looking at alternative methods to fossil fuels. Um, so chemical engineers um, are really in a good position now to work in a growing area. Um, certainly, I mean growing in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, and certainly when you look at the trends uh, of these topical issues, how, how important they are uh, and how popular they are amongst companies, there's a lot of job opportunities to not just make money for yourself and make money for multinational companies, but actually change the way in which production and manufacturing and processing happens, um, that a byproduct would be less damage to the environment uh, and you helping to conserve the environment. So again, it means that there is this whole sector within the sector, which is growing even more so. So job opportunities are really strong within chemical engineering. Uh, and really diverse, just as the subject area is. Now, in terms of, I've mentioned making money. Um, so the ICME UK did um, the salary survey in 2018, uh, in which over 1,500 uh, of its members were surveyed. Uh, so the median salary was 54,000 pound. Um, early career salary uh, was around 30,000 uh, pound. And you can see in the chart then how that differs uh, by age group. In there, it shows as well, chartered engineers versus non-chartered engineers as well. So what I've described already in the chartered engineers uh, have the opportunity to make more money because of the different types of jobs that are available to chartered engineers only. That's, uh, that's really in black and white there for you. Uh, and then I've mentioned some of the areas within, uh, within chemical engineering and the different sectors you go and work in. And it's just uh, from that same survey there, uh, by sector, what the uh, early career salaries are. So oil refining uh, at just about £41,000 per year. One thing um, that is really, really good for students um, in terms of an opportunity to make themselves more employable, uh, and it's been mentioned already, is a urine industry. So um, at Swans University, all of our engineering and computer science programmes uh, have a urine industry option. You would find that very common amongst most uh, university engineering programmes. Um, so a year in industry uh, is a minimum of 40 weeks in duration uh, and it is a paid placement. So a placement must meet certain criteria for students to be allowed to go on to them. One is that it is full time. 
Uh, another that it is paid a minimum of minimum wage. And so we find that an average salary for this year placement is around 17 and a half thousand pound. Another set criteria is that it is graduate level work. So it's not like, you know, when I think back to when I was in school and work experience was you being a, a dog's body and making tea and making photocopies of lots of things. It's not the case. You're going to be working on real engineering projects, uh, working with real money, making real impact. And it's got to meet that, uh, that standard. And then there's a minimum health and safety uh, requirement. So again, it's got to be approved by the university to make sure that uh, the, the welfare and well-being of our students is protected. And as Samantha has mentioned, it's done between year two and year three uh, of a bachelor's programme, uh, or it could also be, be done between year three and year four of the MEng programme. So in the middle of your studies, you would go out, you'd work full time in company and then return for your final year of study. Uh, it's a really, really um, good opportunity in that it will develop your engineering skills uh, in that applied uh, practical sense. Uh, you'll find when you return to your studies, your scores may actually improve because you've got that real world experience that you can relate to when you look at theoretical uh, engineering. It's obviously good in black and white. So on any CV and resumes and in application beyond your degree, you've got evidence of practical work experience in a relevant setting. Uh, it's good for motivation uh, because you actually have a taste of working as an engineer. You'll have a taste of making good money uh, and that should then spur you on uh, to, to achieve a good career as well. So there's lots of different benefits there to do a year in industry placement. Now you'll find that you can either apply for a program with a year in industry. So on UCAS, you can apply for chemical engineering with a year in industry. Or if you don't choose that option, uh, at most universities, you'll be able to add that option on uh, once you're already a student. So in year one or at the beginning of year two, if you didn't pre-select the year industry option, it's just an admin process that can be applied at that stage. Some university will have set criteria for year in industry. So you may need a certain grade average uh, to remain on that program. And then when it comes down to securing a work placement, uh, it's competitive uh, and you will be competing not only against um, your classmates in your university, but also against um, chemical engineering students from all other universities in the UK who are trying to secure a placement. And it is on then um, the companies to select you. You'd have to go through the formal application interview and assessment centre processes that that company would apply to anyone in graduate jobs as well. So it's a little early taste of what the job market is gonna be like in terms of what you need to do. Uh, typically, uh, I know on our database, um, there's gonna be around 900 live placements advertised at any given time across all engineering subject areas. Um, some will be specific only to chemical engineering students. Okay, so there's plenty of opportunity. Um, I know some students who will apply for 30 placements and be rejected 29 times, uh, but secure their one placement. Now, by being rejected 29 times, you're gonna develop resilience, uh, determination. Uh, it is reflective of what can happen in that real world of work beyond the degree as well. So it's a nice practice for that. Others will apply for just five, uh, and be rejected four times and get there one placement. Uh, but it's, it'd be very, very lucky for you to apply and for one and get that one placement. You're gonna need to uh, scatter your bullets a little bit more. And then in terms of getting onto the programme, to move back to what uh, Dr. Gunaratna was uh, talking about uh, in terms of study and what a degree programme is like, to get onto a program, um, this is what the criteria at Swans University is. And again, you'll find there's lots of commonalities across other universities. Uh, and there are some slight differences and nuances amongst universities as well. So for the BEng, that three year program uh, that Samantha spoke about, or if you do it with a year in industry or a year abroad, making it four years, we'd ask for at A levels, AAB to three Bs. 
Now, at Swans University, mathematics is a compulsory subject. Okay, so we'll ask for mathematics uh, at A level if you're studying them uh, to come onto a chemical engineering program. There'll be some universities that don't ask for mathematics. Uh, there'll be some that ask for mathematics and chemistry. There may be others that ask for mathematics and physics. So that's something you need to look at and address on a case by case uh, basis. But for us, maths is the only compulsory subject. And similarly, we accept students from BTEC extended diplomas, uh, as well as all other qualifications. So if you're looking at access, uh, IB, European baccalaureates, uh, or any national uh, domestic um, qualification, there will be an offer there for you. Now for an MEng, so that integrated masters, that is four years in duration, uh, or five years if you choose to do it with a year in industry or a year abroad, we'd ask for uh, higher grades at A level. So typically three A's to AAB, and again with maths compulsory subject at Swans University. Again, this differs university to university, so you'll have to address it case by case. At Swansea, you could enter onto the BEng pathway and after year two, transfer onto the MEng pathway. So again, if you're meeting a certain uh, grade average, then you can transfer from the bachelor's to the integrated master's programme during the programme itself. And then there's a foundation year option. So if you're not studying any of the compulsory subjects required at the university of your choice, uh, or if your grades and at the required level. You can either apply outright uh, for uh, a BEng with a foundation year, or a university may offer it to you uh, instead of the, the BEng or the MEng programme. Or if you apply for the BEng or the MEng and it comes to results day uh, and it doesn't meet the required entry for, for year one, then again, most universities will offer you that foundation year option then. So the foundation year is uh, it differs, again, uni to uni, so ours is a general engineering uh, foundation year, um, where the sciences and the maths at fundamental levels, including some other engineering subjects, uh, are delivered to the uh, content and standard of A-levels. So to get onto the programme, uh, we would typically want strong GCSE in sciences and maths, and then uh, lower A-levels than BEng or MEng entry. I should say as well, um, this differs uni to uni, but um, once you receive an offer, that offer is not set in stone. So universities are very flexible. So they're flexible beyond the offer that you are issued. Um, it can be amended prior to results in a lot of cases. Uh, and at the point of results, universities are flexible. Okay, So if you haven't quite met the required grades of your offer, um, as a whole. So if you've been offered three Bs, but you achieve BCC, um, but that B is in mathematics, which is, you know, we know an important subject, um, then again, you would likely be accepted onto that BEng program. But again, that is case by case dependent on university. Now, when you were applying to the university as well, these offers are determined primarily, in our case at Swansea, by your predicted grades and the subjects you are studying. We also take into account attained grades, so what you had at GCSEs or their equivalents. We take into account your personal statement uh, and your references. Now, when it comes to your personal statement, things that are important to get across uh, would be your knowledge of the subject area uh, and the sector as a whole. So hopefully Dr. Gunaratma's talk has really helped you to gain an understanding of what chemical engineering is. You need to express that in application. You know what you're getting into. Next is your ambition and your motivations. So why you want to, uh, to, to go ahead and forge a career in chemical engineering? What is your motivations? Where do you want to go with it and why? And then talking about yourself, um, do you have any relevant work experience? Um, so I know that is hard, um, certainly in the current climate, um, to gain practical work experience. I know even on any normal year, uh, people from different backgrounds have different opportunities. Uh, and so not having work experience isn't going to go against you. But if you do have anything, certainly include that. If there's anything that uh, is relevant and transferable, Okay, so any work or volunteering that you may have done, 
um, and be clear about what sort of skills you developed or personal qualities that came to the fourth because of uh, that, those opportunities. Um, put them down because they are transferable and helps us to get a picture of what you're like. Similarly, extracurricular stuff. So if you're a member of sports teams or if you're a head girl or a head boy or a prefect, um, or if you're a member of any societies or clubs, or if you worked on a project that was relevant and related to engineering or chemical engineering, include that because it does help us to get a picture of what you're like. And at the point of making an offer or at a point on results day where um, your application is being considered for you one entry or whether it's foundation year entry, then again, that personal statement uh, would be really important for you. Okay, so that's just some tips uh, from me uh, on how to get onto a programme that Dr. Gunaratna uh, has explained really well uh, and what you can do then with a chemical engineering degree uh, in terms of the job opportunities in the sector as a whole and important things that you need to consider now when you are looking at university programmes. So things that you need to be checking on to make sure you are in a good position to maximise this opportunity of going to university. So, um, I do hope that you found that useful. Um, I hope that uh, all of the content in today's session has been very helpful. Thank you very much for listening.